Morning. Morning. I'm reversed. Does that surprise me? Are you? I don't know if I am or yeah. not. From the, they had a test camera to tell you whether or not you, what, what they were going to show, which was a different aspect oh. of the shoot anyway. And I'm reversed. I think I don't know what I would look like if it wasn't the mirrored view. Hi, Alan. Hey, Alan. Hi. It's tough. So you guys, uh, it's very early for you guys, right? Not Matt so. Matt and I. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. About 9 a.m. here. So it's. All right. For Kirsten, uh, when she joins, um, it's three hours behind, or two hours behind for her, right? Yeah, two hours for me, one hour for you, Matt. Okay. So she's on the other side. Mm -hmm. Forgot we have a whole cascade of time zones. Where are you, Alan? Uh, well, I'm in Helsinki, so I'm I'm at source here. So I'm at uh, you know it's just coming up to four o'clock now for me. So um, nearly beer o'clock, shall we say? Mm -hmm. oh. Getting there anyway. <laughs> we'll take one for the team and join you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, drinking in the morning—that's healthy. <laughs> yeah, I want to get to Helsinki in the next two years. One of my goals. You should be. Should come next year. We'll do this again next year, but we'll do it like, you know, I think everyone's going to be gagging to travel and do things next year. So we should definitely do it again. Why don't we do it in the fall? Like, let's just yeah. have one in September. <laughs> yeah, but we're so behind with the uh, vaccination program that, uh, you know, I don't even know if by the autumn we'll be there. So, but next year, right? Next year for sure. Hi, Kirsten. Oh, you're on mute, maybe. Are you on mute? Well, no, you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. But you could make expressions like that for the entire session, and that would be awesome. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Just a pen and teller thing. Yeah, this is going to be an issue because Kirsten's the kind of the expert here. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's be interesting. We still got two minutes. It's cool. No. no. Yeah, it's, it's not this one. This one's showing you as unmuted. So it's something to do with your uh, your setup, right? So um, I Click don't know if you got the gear to... at the bottom of the screen. You might have a weird microphone set up. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Click that gear and then it will have um, your microphone. It'll say what the default is. You can click that and in the drop down, there'll be like, um... oh, she's gone again. But that's that's what she needs to do, right? I think she needs to check the uh, what her default is. And okay, is that better? There we go. Yes. yes. Okay. Are you, you guys aren't getting an echo, right? Correct. No, just a little room tone. Because uh, I, I I switched it to my monitor for my headphones. So for some reason, it's it like just play old ordinary headphones. It swapped my inputs when I got in here from the other session. So. Okay, so we're just coming up to the hour. We've got already six people in the room, which is pretty good. We haven't had so many questions, uh, to be honest, from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in Finland, you know, the people just don't really ask questions. It's uh, not in the nature of the Finnish people. So we can uh, take the questions that we had coming in. So let's kick it off. Um, Hello, welcome to the uh, roundtable we have this afternoon with uh, data stacks. Um, it is focus on your data, not your database. So let's do a short intro um, with you guys. Um, let's kick off with Catherine. Just give us a couple of words about who you are. Sure. Hi, I'm Kat Erickson. I have more of a hardware background, but somehow uh, landed at data stacks almost seven years ago. Um, so I've been here when Cassandra was really hard to use, kind of hard to use, and now um, more of a delight to use. So it's been a fun ride. Nice. And uh, Matt? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm on the software side of things. That's my background and a bunch of information retrieval stuff. I did a bunch of work with Apache Solar for a long time and relational databases and now uh, NoSQL and uh, database as a service stuff. 
Okay, cool. And Kirsten? Hi, uh, I'm a, a developer advocate, and what that means is I try to make the experience as awesome as possible for our developers. Um, you know, we create tools, we have lots of workshops. Um, we, we usually have a few every week um, that are free, um, and we teach you how to do stuff, sometimes with just Cassandra, but um, oftentimes with Astra, uh, using different languages. Um, so um, I am a uh, an API evangelist by, by my my very nature. Um, I, I love working with APIs. So um, it's been so exciting to, to play with Stargate and see how many different ways uh, you can interact with your data without having mm -hmm. to know uh, a database query language. Nice. Well, you're definitely at the right conference here. So let's, let's kick off the round table then. So, I mean, the burning question is, you know, Focus on your data, not your database. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, I, I can take that. Um, um, you know, so so to, uh, we've gotten to the point now, even though it's Cassandra, with, which a lot of people find very intimidating, by creating Stargate, we've made it possible for people to interact with their data using a REST API, a document API, which is kind of like uh, MongoDB uses. Uh, so you just put documents in the database, you have no schema. And then there's also a GraphQL a API that will go against your, your schema database. So um, we let people um, figure out how they want to interact with their data um, and, and don't, make the, don't make them worry about how the database is doing the stuff which is really where uh, the stumbling block comes for a lot of, especially front-end de developers, but also um, back-end developers uh, don't necessarily want to be DBAs. And uh, we don't want them to spend their time on that, so. Yeah, I would, make sense. I, I would, I'd be happy to add to that too, that there, there's the, the consistency of interface, the common API. REST is a pattern that we know. GraphQL is a pattern that we know. Uh, the document interfaces use just JSON documents back and forth. So we're not learning anything new. That's nice. You don't have to learn a query language. But the other side is Cassandra is actually pretty awesome. Uh, it's known for being able to scale like crazy. And it can do it with high concurrency, which I'm sure I'll talk about later. But that's a big deal to me for APIs. But it required you to have several <laughs> expert engineers and the equivalent of the boiler room, keeping the thing stoked and running and effective and you needed to know it. And so you had a whole nother team just for operations and DBA. And with Astra, you don't have to do that. Great, so it sounds good. So, you know, you're, you're talking about Astra here. Yesterday I spoke to the guys about Stargate, uh, not, not the TV show about your other product, Stargate. And, we'll talk about um, that. <laughs> but, uh, I got the Stargates, so I'm totally up on that if you wanna. <laughs> me too. Me too. This this could digress somewhere else. Digress. Okay. Um, staying on, on on focus here, right? Uh, what, what's the difference between like Stargate and Astra? Can you tell us a little bit more about Astra? Sure, I can take uh, this one. Oh, okay. go ahead. Okay, go I'll ahead. take it. Oh, you. <laughs> yeah. So everyone's pretty familiar with Cassandra, and when we talk to Cassandra users, and we say like, you know, what's hard? What keeps more people from like jumping on the Cassandra train. And they said kind of two things. It's pretty difficult to operate at scale sometimes. And it's pretty difficult to write apps against if it's not something that you do every day. And so the first thing we decided to, to tackle was the op side. And so that so we thought, you know, Cassandra is scale out open source, Kubernetes scale out open source, cloud native. If we could add the cloud native piece to our story, then these two things would work pretty amazingly together and hopefully eliminate 95% of the ops that uh, folks encounter with the database. And so that's really what Astra is. It is a cloud native, um, fully Kubernetesized um, Cassandra. And so then the other piece has always been the development side. And I've sat in on these conversations for seven years, and, and we always thought, you know, we could do REST, you know, GraphQL or other APIs at the time, and we thought, but we can't do that and sacrifice the scale of the database. And so when we took a step back and we said, well, what percentage of our users really need kind of the Netflix and Apple scale of Cassandra? 
and maybe 10, maybe 20% at the most. And then the other thing that was kind of a breakthrough moment for us was thinking, well, what if it was like an API gateway? What if the developer was operating on this side and we had the cloud native service on the other side? Over time, we take like what might be generated as an imperfect data model and transparently migrate it in the background to something that is super scalable. And we thought like, like yeah, like we can, we can do this. And so Stargate is that developer gateway that lets developers have what they want, which is not to care about the database. And in the background, if there's optimizations and changes that need to happen, that can happen, but we've gotten it to a point where you can just start writing code, get a pretty good uh, data model on the back end, and go from there. One of the things that's really important to note um, is uh, our commitment to open source. So, um, you know, Cassandra is an open source uh, a system that that uh, we contribute to quite heavily. Um, we are our our team is is uh, some of the the biggest contributors there. But what you might not know is that Stargate is also an open source project. So if you start playing with our stuff and you think it's kind of cool, but you want to host it yourself and you want to do that work. Um, you can also put uh, those APIs on your Cassandra instance without um, interacting with us at all. Um, you, um, the uh, our goal, you know, the, what our, what's our company goal? Our company goal is to increase the use of Cassandra, and whether that's people using Astra or people installing their own systems and uh, bringing people into the community. Um, so. Um, so you you can do it yourself too. So we're not just trying to sell you a product. We're we're uh, we're trying to enable you to to uh, really leverage uh, Cassandra and the way it works for you. Yeah, I just have one piece. I think that's really important, and I skipped over that with the Astra side as well. When you start hearing a different version of Cassandra, you start thinking fork, 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 and it's important to note that most of the stuff that we've done with um, with Astra is open sourced as well. So the metrics collection pieces, the management sidecars, the operators, those are all open source now. And anything extra, we're um, putting SCEPs into the uh, Cassandra project, and we want everyone to have access to all of this. But also, you cannot worry about it. Just use Astra. And, yeah, connect, exactly. and not have to operationalize. But also, <laughs> it's nice this. to know if you're building a long-term architecture too, that it's it's pervasive and people have access to it and you're not necessarily tied completely to a vendor. Well, and, and if you're trying, if you already have a Cassandra instance and you don't want to move it to us, then mm -hmm. you can slap Stargate on there and now you have APIs for the data that you already are using. So, um, you know, there's lots of different ways. Um, we, we just want to make everybody you know, enjoy their Cassandra experience. That sounds good. Sounds good. I'm going to switch the conversation slightly um, because serverless is something that, that's springing to a lot of people's minds at the moment. It's, it's like a trending topic. Uh, does data stack support anything in this area? Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, like, you. <laughs> I, get, I get excited about serverless. I'm, I'm super excited about the serverless stuff we've done inside Astra too, where we've taken the traditional Cassandra composition and broken down some of the roles so that they can be distributed in a way that's much more cloud native. Boy, I could go into that, but I feel like it's it's too deep in the the architecture of Cassandra. But the, the offshot of that is you have this database that can deal with really high concurrency. It can scale out. Um, and then you tie that. So that's, our, that's the serverless Astra database offering. And I get excited when I think about tying that to things like uh, Cloudflare's edge functions and writing APIs where the whole stack is serverless end to end. And you get to the point where essentially to take down the functionality of the API that you're writing, you have to take down the internet, right? Like mm. um, we've kidded about calling this like an availability first architecture. Um, and it starts with no central point of failure in the database. And then it moves to all the neat stuff we're doing with edge APIs. And then all of a sudden we have all the scalability and all the durability we could ever want, just uptime forever. 
Yeah, and um, uh, as a developer advocate, um, <laughs> I will mention uh, that you can't. So we used to have a free tier um, in uh, in Astra, um, and it may look like that's gone away, but it has not really gone away. Uh, when you get an Astra serverless instance, you get twenty five dollars a month um, uh, credited to you. Like so, so and and uh, twenty five dollars a month will do quite a bit of stuff. Um, I mean, I myself um, beat the snot out of Astra on a regular basis, and I'm like at four dollars for the month. So, um, and and we'll let you know. You don't have to have a credit card to sign up. Um, so you can just start playing right away. Um, it's pretty cool, though. Like the serverless story. You know, when you think about what it means to operate Cassandra, and then what it means not to have to operate Cassandra, and then to think, okay, well, I still have to go through all the same sizing exercises to figure out how many nodes or capacity units that I need to start. And in some ways you kind of felt like you were back in this, like, are they just running Cassandra for me or is this a service? You know, when you have a service, you expect to pay for what you need to be able to scale things kind of independently of each other, especially in a cloud native world. And so, you know, this is one of those ideas that started years ago was different engineers thinking, can I offload this from the main Cassandra cluster? Can I offload this management task? And then us taking a step back and saying, can we actually separate out everything mm -hmm. and not just compute and storage, but, you know, scale network separately as well. Can we, you know, can we really start modularizing this Zoom Cassandra in this on-demand model? And um, replicating it cool. in a cloud-friendly way, so it doesn't go down either. So, yeah, I think about my API writing days, and like you just ignore it; you don't think about it because if the database goes down, you're done. And mm -hmm. so you pay attention to the rest of the stack because you're at the whim of the database. And then when you move to a cloud-native database, the database has redundancies that keep it from going down, either in a region or across regions with Cassandra. And then you don't live in fear of that database under the bed that's going to come up and bite you. That's a good point, yeah. Very good point. Hey, switching over to the uh, developer for, for a second, and maybe Kirsten is the right person to answer this question. Uh, if an external developer wants to access your data, how does DataSax support uh, that onboarding and make it secure? Uh, that's really good. I haven't done much with the uh, with the authentication for uh, at the user level. Um, so for our authentication, um, what we have is uh, is tokens that you can create for, with different um, uh, permissions, right? So you can have a read only token. Uh, you can have a read write to a particular thing token. You can have um, uh, it, it, and when they make their calls, they're going to use that uh, in the header. Um, so you control uh, the access specifically. Okay. That's that's organizations too, which I feel like is part of that. Um, in terms of just sharing your databases out with people just by adding them to an organization that you have. All right. We, we've, we've got a question from the audience that we picked up before. Um, and I'll put it out there. <laughs> you might be able to answer it. Let's see. What is the future of data flow and how can smaller companies prepare for it? Oh my gosh, we could talk about this all day. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think we all have an opinion. The future of data flow, I think right now we still see mostly humans doing queries. And I think in the future of data flow, we see mostly uh, machine and automation uh, doing queries. And so I think I'm, I'm going to try to leave, leave uh, cloud composition and composing stacks to Matt, but because um, I know I know it's like his favorite story to tell. Um, but in the future of, of data flows, I think I, I think that we know the different places data can end up, and the flows of data can be somewhat automated or AI used to find the smartest route for data, which is then mostly queried by um, by machines. And I think that's a few years, not far away. No, not at all. Um, mm -hmm. Kat alluded to this idea of cloud composition. I think about the old design patterns books for object-oriented design and how we would compose 
classes to accomplish certain things. And I think that there's a there's a meta version of that that we're just like on the cusp of where we say, look, uh, we have some data, we have some information, but we don't know what's of value in it. We don't really know what the information in the data is. And then we have a bunch of different mechanisms for getting information out of the data, for getting signal out of the noise of more and more sensor data or user clicks or uh, uh, attempts to break into our networks or whatever it is we're actually working with. And we have these systems that we can feed it to, and they're all different. They're all good at partic particular things. Um, Elasticsearch can do some neat things with time sequencing and feature detection. Um, we have all of these entity extraction tools and things that look for anomalies. We can do, uh, we can go to Google's TensorFlow and add things in and actually build these linear regressions that, that help us favor what we're going to show is content for personalization. But all of these machines are in their own silos, right? They all live one place or the other. So one of the things we're going to be doing, I think, in the next five years is we're not going to be trying to implement them all on the same database at the same location internally. We're going to be looking at how we can compose uh, these enrichment as a service items and then bring that data back to whoever needs to present it. Maybe it's it's Cassandra with Stargate in front of it uh, to go that final mile to bring the recommended content back to the user. But we're going to be building these perpetual ETLs, these enrichment data flows that live in things like uh, Apache Pulsar. Um, and you just set up the data and it sort of farms itself and brings you back information. I'm a little too excited about that, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, I think vendor. that makes sense. You can compose your app based on what is best for that app, and it should be easy. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I love that the things that we do make it much easier to have uh, one one place where one piece of data lives um, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, all this duplicate information everywhere. Um, you know, a lot of the NoSQL databases let you just throw whatever in there. And and that works for some things, like um, for Craigslist, it's great, right? They they went from Mongo to, uh, they went from uh, MySQL to Mongo and uh, solved a lot of problems they had. But, you know, in the real world, if you have a user who has a shopping list, that's the same user that has an account. And it might be the same user who has, you know, a wish list or whatever. And we should just be looking at, you know, one user thing. Um, and so I think uh, we make it easier to um, describe your data um, in, in a way that removes redundancy. Cool. That was that was a good question then. Um, we, we still got a little bit of time left. Um, Another uh, question that was asked in advance was, um, what's the scope of the API, API gateway in this discussion? Um, so, so Stargate is essentially an, an API gateway. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it, okay. it performs that that uh, that thing. And, and but so for anybody who's interested also in the APIs, I'm doing a workshop um, tomorrow, um, and then again on Thursday. Um, here I'll put the. I'll put the link in and it is basically exactly that it's it's play with our apis you know you're going to put a couple cavemen in the database and then you're going to update them and then you're going to delete them and it's uh so you just see the whole crud uh for all all three of the um api types um mm -hmm. so um it's free you will come you you'll get an astra instance um and uh so you'll have that 25 dollars a month and uh yeah. yeah, I've been super happy about the workshops that we've been doing too. If you have any interest at all, um, it's you know no strings attached. Come hop into one of the workshops and see what's here. Uh, they'll and, be running whatever. Yeah, and a lot of them are are not at all about data stacks. Like we have an intro to Cassandra series. Um, you know, we have we have uh, you know we talk about tools and um, y y again. What we want is to uh, increase the um, the the reach of the Cassandra, and um, so uh, cool our workshops as well. All right, so this is now you're starting to make a little bit more sense now. I'm starting to over the last couple of days, it's all starting to click a little bit. What's going on now, which is good. Uh, what about? Um, uh, microservice platform um, like Kubernetes, for example, how does how does that fit into this equation? 
we actually have a project we're working on, which is uh, Kate Sandra, um, which okay. is uh, is a, a way to um, use Cassandra, uh, use Kubernetes to um, to manage your, your notes and everything. And um, and uh, it's 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 uh, we've had a couple workshops on it, so you can look that up on YouTube if you want. Um, but um, basically, again, it's an open source project and um you know that is something that a lot of people need um you know something that that can be a little smarter about how that stuff is is uh is managed um and uh and yeah it's it's a, we're very very uh excited about using kubernetes in the stack one esoteric thing yeah go ahead Kat. i was gonna say i think it's probably uh worth just a minute to kind of uh, describe the stack so that people I think we've talked about a few different projects. Everything we do is built around Cassandra, right? And so you have uh, Cassandra and, and picture in the middle, you have Kubernetes. And by getting Cassandra to play well with Kubernetes, it kind of opens up this, this ecosystem of, of things that we can make easier, right? So you have Cassandra, which is now cloud native with Stargate on top as this uh, developer gateway with these great APIs. And then when you start looking left and right at these adjacencies, getting data in and making data um, available in um, uh, a more API friendly way. So you think like uh, Pulsar, Kafka, um, and then you think metrics and reporting. And Kate Sandra is really kind of pulling those together and saying, look, you don't want to get 14 different open source projects. You know, we don't have to do that anymore with Kubernetes. Here's a pretty composable stack that puts together kind of this story that we're telling in these different projects. And that's when you're running your own Cassandra too. Like there is this other version of, um, I built an API, I deployed it on Kubernetes because I want this ease of management. I'm gonna hook it up to Astra as a cloud database, which has the same internals. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a couple things doing that that are Maybe they're a little in the weeds, but they're easier than they ever were. There was an, an old world of Cassandra. There was always this friction between, um, do I have a database for every microservice or do I share my big 20 node database across my microservices? How much do I want to pay for availability versus partitioning and isolation? And one of the small effects of our serverless in Astra is you don't have to think about that anymore. You just set up a database for each one and it, it it is what it is and it gets the resources that it needs in that isolation. So if your architecture is share nothing for your microservices, it's a lot more to it's a lot easier to imagine just doing that on Astra and just when I want to isolate, I set up a new database and that's a new partition of data for a specific microservice and I make some tokens just for that and give them to that stack and I know that I'm not cross polluting between microservices. One of the other things that's uh, important to note about the new serverless is that uh, in the, the old free tier world, uh, you could only have one database. Um, but with serverless, we let you have multiples, um, which is fantastic, especially if you're you're trying to test stuff out or play with new ideas. Um, you don't have to, you can have one database where you have your stuff and then you can, you can make another database where you can play without um, worrying about what might happen to your production data. <clears throat> nice, nice. So I know that we could probably go on all, all day speaking mm -hmm. like this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, but unfortunately, we've uh, reached the end of the session. Okay. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming today. It was uh, it was a blast. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, let's see Thanks you in everybody. Helsinki next year. Oh, yeah, we will be, be there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Talk <laughs> later. Thanks, guys. Bye bye.